We're going to tackle four topics, starting with why AI matters to general radiologists and especially chest radiologists. Imaging volumes have been growing year on year, every year. And as the U.S. population ages, this trend will probably continue for the foreseeable future. As chest radiologists, we own a substantial piece of this pie. Whether your perspective is CT imaging in the United States or all imaging studies around the world. And our slice of this expanding pile will probably grow as lung cancer screening continues to gain traction. It's important to remind ourselves that as imaging volumes have been climbing, so have expectations for their prompt interpretation. And all of this is in a setting where reimbursement for imaging studies has been falling over the long term. All of this puts us in a classic engineering dilemma. Asking folks to work harder and expanding the labor pool will partly help, but in the end, we're probably going to have to innovate our way out of this. And that's where AI comes in. So what's the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning? And how are things like self-driving Teslas and reading chest x-rays connected to each other? Here's how I think about it. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is basically any technology that can do a task that a human does. It could be a very basic task like turning on a light bulb or much more advanced stuff like visual perception or decision making. There are two main strategies to make AI work. One approach is explicit programming, where a human programmer painstakingly writes lines and lines of written instructions in advance for a computer to execute. The computer doesn't need to learn or be trained, it just has to blindly follow a preordained set of instructions, which also means it won't get better over time. The other strategy is machine learning, or ML, where a computer can learn how to do a task by itself without needing a human to explicitly program every single instruction. It takes way more computing power and engineers to get this to work than explicit programming. But when it does, you've got a computer that can learn, which, makes it, which means it can get better at a task with training. Depending on the task, humans learn in different ways. For example, we learn history in school differently from the way we learn math. So it's not surprising that there are different ways a computer doing ML can learn too. There's reinforcement learning, which can be used in self-driving cars and personalized ads. There's unsupervised learning, which can be used in marketing analyses. There's semi-supervised learning, which can be used by search engines to classify websites. And then there's supervised learning, which can be used for filtering spam and also for interpreting medical images. Regardless of the learning method, there's a couple of ways to construct the intelligence that does the learning. And a successful technique has been to mimic the way neural nets in our own brains work. And that's a technique folks call deep learning, which has unlocked lots of potential in medical imaging interpretation. When radiology folks talk about AI these days, they're usually referring to the pink area in this Venn diagram. In conversation, however, the distinction between terms like deep learning, ML, and AI often kind of bleed into each other and can end up taking on the same meaning. Sort of like how American politicians use words like people and Americans interchangeably, even though one term is technically a subset of the other. So that's how I think about AI. Let's move on to how AI models are trained to interpret medical images. But instead of a task like recognizing lung cancer, Let's use a simpler one, like distinguishing dolphins from porpoises. If we were an AI system learning this task, we'd start by looking at this image and deciding if we thought it was a dolphin or a porpoise. Since it's possible we might have never seen either before, we might just take a random guess and then learn this one was actually a porpoise. Okay, we'd look at a second image and take another guess and then learn that this one was actually a dolphin. Maybe we'd look at two more examples like this one and this one, which would begin to give us a rough sense now 
about how to distinguish dolphins from porpoises. We'd probably get a little better after seeing a couple more examples like these four other guys. We didn't get explicit instructions from a marine biologist for this task, but we're probably better than a random coin flip now. Although we may not be able to easily describe how our mental model works in words, and we're not perfect yet, we've learned how to distinguish dolphins from porpoises ourselves simply by being exposed to a lot of examples, which we refer to in aggregate as a data set. And since this one was used to train us, it's a training data set. The ground truth for each individual case is its label. Labels can range from precise and accurate or clean to sort of ambiguous and inaccurate or noisy. Either way, the more training cases we see, the better we'll get, especially if the labels are accurate and the cases diverse. For lung cancer on CT, it can take thousands upon thousands of training cases. So large, cleanly labeled data sets are a big part of radiology AI and building these data sets can take a hell of work. Now let's get back to our mental model. How do we distinguish, how do we measure how good we are? One way would be to test ourselves using a couple of cases we hadn't seen before, like these four cases. We'd call these four cases our test data set. Now let's say these had been our responses and that these were the ground truth labels. We could grade ourselves by calculating the percent we got correct. We could learn a little bit more about our abilities by looking at our true and false positive rates for calling something a dolphin. But what if we could also assign partial credit for cases we almost got right? it turns out there's a way we can. Let's look at this fella. We may have incorrectly called a dolphin earlier in our test. Let's say we were sort of on the fence about him. Maybe if we had been given an eight point scale, we would have given him a five and called him a dolphin. Now for argument's sake, let's say it was very important on this test that we didn't overcall things dolphins. In that case, we might have chosen a more rigorous threshold or operating point before we started. And a five would have meant calling him a porpoise now instead of a dolphin, since five fell below our more rigorous operating point. AI models work like this too. They often express their confidence of an outcome as a score. And what the score means can be defined by whether that score falls above or below a pre-selected operating point. Even if your innate ability to distinguish things is the same, choosing a different operating point can alter your true positive and false positive rates. If we plotted true positive rate against false positive rate for one operating point, we might get this. And if we did the same thing for a different operating point, we might get this. And if we did this for lots of different other operating points, we could end up with a plot that looks like this, which we could fit a curve to and get this, an ROC curve. ROC curves for people or systems that are really good at innately distinguishing things from one another look like this, while bad classifiers like a random coin flip have ROC curves that look like this. So a way of measuring how innately good a classifier is, is the area under the ROC curve or AUC. The higher the AUC, the better the classifier. When assessing how well a radiology AI model works, a common convention is to compare the AUC of a standalone AI with the AUC of an unassisted radiologist, or the AUC of a radiologist with AI assistance 
versus a radiologist without AI assistance. Doing AUC comparisons like these requires a radiologist to tell you where they are on a suspicion scale instead of just a straight yes or no answer. In tasks where this isn't feasible and only an up or down response is appropriate, we just fall back to directly comparing sensitivity and specificity. So what's the existing state of AI in chest radiology and where are we headed? There's a lot of AI work being done across radiology today, and it turns out chest radiology is where a huge amount of the emphasis is. What AI currently does well in chest imaging are common, basic chest radiology interpretation tasks in isolation. Tasks like telling whether a chest x-ray is normal, or whether there's pneumonia, or active TB on the chest x-ray or if there's lung cancer in a chest CT volume. AI models that successfully tackle these kind of everyday tasks currently exist and can be used in many ways. For example, a team in Korea recently showed that a commercially available AI assistance tool could help third year radiology residents do a better job catching important findings on chest x-rays. AI assistants can up-level ED docs reading chest x-rays for pneumonia substantially improving their sensitivity while reducing their overcalls. Although AI models may not always improve the accuracy of a chest radiologist or a diagnostic radiologist, a general radiologist reading a chest x-ray for active TB, they can really help primary care providers who need to read chest x-rays in parts of the TB endemic developing world where radiologists are in very short supply. There's also a lot of AI development work with chest CT too, especially for lung cancer. An AI system developed at Google in 2019 outperformed six radiologists at interpreting chest CTs for lung cancer screening, achieving fewer false negatives and fewer false positives. AI models can be used in non-interpretive roles too. Models that can distinguish normal chest x-rays from abnormal ones can help prioritize work lists so abnormal chest x-rays get read sooner, allowing folks to substantially drive down the reporting time for chest x-rays with actionable findings. So what's the catch? How come this is the world I actually see in my reading room today? The TLDR is we're still in the very early days of radiology AI. The promising performance we're seeing has mostly been in very controlled environments and test data sets. Will an AI model perform the same when it's running inference on images from your department, in your patient populations, and for a real reading room? It's certainly possible, but we don't know yet. Most models haven't been thoroughly vetted in the real world, and there have been few, if any, clinical trials so far. For many AI models, folks also haven't entirely figured out how to efficiently interface AI outputs into radiologist workflows in a non-disruptive way that preserves a radiologist's efficiency and flow to make their use in busy practices practical. There are also lots of regulatory hurdles to overcome. While we know the FDA will be a big player, the regulatory process for medical AI is still unfolding. Local reasons may exist too, such as insufficient IT infrastructure and tech expertise to support AI and insufficient buy-in from some executives and leaders. And importantly, there aren't enough large clean data sets out there, especially public ones, to aggressively drive the state of the art forward and also to help tackle other less common or more intricate tasks in chest radiology. Fortunately, I believe that most of these obstacles are surmountable and I hope you'll see them overcome early in your careers. So what do I think our future looks like? I think there's a good chance mainstream use of AI will first appear behind the scenes, helping to ensure that imaging studies are being ordered, accepted, and prioritized appropriately, and helping to drive more focused and relevant QA and QC. Once folks become more comfortable with AI in their daily practice, mainstream use in the reading room will probably follow, assisting us with common basic interpretive tasks like the ones we looked at. That still leaves lots and lots of tasks 
for radiologists to handle without AI. We'll continue to be quite busy, especially since imaging volumes and other expectations will probably rise. We'll have to be vigilant about potential downsides of AI. Could we be relinquishing too much control of our patient's health to industry? Can we keep our patient's health data secure? Will we trust AI too much? And how will AI affect our perceived value to our non-radiology colleagues? Hopefully, this has been informative. I'd like to leave you with one final slide before I finish. I think it's important to keep in mind how critical the shortage of specialists trained to interpret medical imaging actually is around the world, especially in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia. In many of these regions, it's often not imaging equipment that's the limiting factor for radiology to improve patients' lives, but the availability of talent to interpret those images.